Welcome everybody. I wanna start by thanking you for attending today's webinar. My name is Leah and I am the brand manager at Ellen Horn. Before we go ahead and get started, I'm just gonna do some quick housekeeping things. So we do ask that you keep yourselves on mute uh, during the presentation. There will be times for question discussions. You can feel free to unmute yourself and chat then. I will be moderating the chat. So if you do have any questions while our presenter is presenting, feel free to put them in there and I'll make sure that she gets those. Uh, and there will be some interactive pieces during the presentation today. Uh, so just keep a lookout for those. So real quick, I just wanna introduce our presenter. Our presenter today is Shelly Simpson. She's the clinical director and AMBIT coordinator of Ellen Horn Los Angeles. So, oh, one more thing, quickly forgot. We are recording this. So if you don't wanna be recorded, please keep your video off. So Shelly, over to you. Great, thank you, Leah. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, I will get my PowerPoint going in just a second, but I first just wanted to give everyone the heads up that there will be um, a couple slides in. I'll, um, un I'll stop sharing my screen, so I'll come back together with all of you. And we're gonna play a little game. It'll be short, it'll be painless. I promise it has a purpose. Um, and so in that, if you feel comfortable, I'd love for you to turn your screen on. And then if you wanna keep it off for the rest of the time, that is fine. Um, so no offense to whatever you choose, but, but just the heads up in case you wanna participate. Uh, so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, so presentation today, mentalize but make it fun. How playfulness can expand perspective taking? Um, so oftentimes we get into these situations with clients or with team members where things feel really stale and stuck or boring. Um, and how do we use mentalizing and mentalized based activity to sort of lighten the room or sometimes even to lighten a fire under a client? Um, how do we use it to, how do we use play to keep our brains turned on? How do we use play to sort of connect? Uh, so we're going to talk all about that. We're going to talk a little bit about play itself which I am um, by no means a, an expert in any type of play therapy, uh, but I do think I'm an expert in um, playfulness in my own life, which you're going to probably see in this presentation. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what is mentalizing, um, some non-mentalizing modes, uh, and then how to sort of bring play and mentalizing together. Uh, and please uh, unmute yourself to ask questions, type questions in the chat feature. Uh, Leah will be sort of helping me read those questions out loud so we can answer them. As well, as we're going to have two interactive activities. And in those activities, um, I'm going to ask you to sort of answer some questions in the chat box if you feel comfortable doing that. And I'll kind of read them aloud. Um, so I'm trying to make this as in interactive as possible uh, because I put fun in the title. And I was like, what did I get myself into? You put fun in the title of a virtual hour-ish presentation, like, are people going to really expect this to be fun? Um, what are we on, like, month 2700 of virtual presentations? Uh, so that kind of got in the way of me putting this presentation together, because every time I sat down to do it, I was like, fun, playfulness, mentalization, and my brain just slowly started to shut down while my amygdala started to take over, uh, and all the panicky thoughts uh, came up front. So what did I do? I went to West Texas and I ziplined through a canyon. Um, and that's a picture my mother-in-law took of me. Uh, I looked very confident. I was not. Uh, and then I came back and I, I started working on this presentation. And I, I tell you all of this because in a way, play is very purposeful for us, right? Play as a definition or to play, the action is to engage in an activity with no apparent purpose, right? We just, um, as little kids, pick up our shovel and our pail and we go to play. Um, and maybe the purpose comes out and we're building a beautiful fan castle, but that's really not what gets us going. But as therapists and team leaders and adults trying to cope in this world, 
we can purposely use play. We can call on play to settle ourselves. We can call on play to increase our own experiences of joy. We can call on play to bring our team members together. And we can call on play to help our clients. Um, a lot of my treatment plans with clients, especially if we are doing some mentalization-based work, um, there will be a goal of increasing play and joy. Um, and sometimes I get some pushback from clients, like, why am I in this program to, to play around, right? Why am I coming to Allen Horn to play around? I want to sit down and just do therapy, or I just want to get a job. And oftentimes what I tell people is we lose our sense of play and we lose our sense of fun. And in that, we kind of lose a piece of ourselves. Um, and in a lot of this work, I'm helping people sort of rebuild their identity and who they want to be and their purpose and their goals. And fun is a big part of that because it's how we figure that stuff out. Um, it's also how we can measure if we're feeling better, right? Like if you're feeling depressed and you don't engage in any joyful activities, then it's really hard to tell when the depression is sort of weighing, right? Um, and so a lot of times, you know, we'll all get clients who experience a lot of anhedonia, sort of pleasure deafness. And I'll be like, play anyways, play anyways, because if we don't play, then we'll never know when that stuff's starting to go down. Or we never know when that stuff's starting to go back up. So play can actually be a really purposeful measure of mood. Um, so for us as therapists, for practitioners, for team leaders, while we do play, hopefully, with no apparent purpose, um, we also play with purpose. So now we're going to play. So this is where I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you all. And if you would like to play this game, please turn on your screen. But what this game is, is a simple, safe for work game of never have I ever. Um, I'm sure, I'm going to just say this. If you went to college, you probably played this at a party. Um, it's how you get to know your peers. But we're going to make it safe for work, which the ones I played in college when I was, you know, 20 were, were probably not appropriate um, for this venue. Um, but I, you know, I can share stories offline if anyone would like to hear. Um, so how you play Never Have I Ever, if you hold up five fingers, and I'll say, never have I ever eaten octopus. And if you've ate octopus, you would put a finger down, right? So if you haven't, you leave your finger up. So that's just the test run. So reset your fingers. And I'm gonna, I have my questions written down because I was kind of like, oh, I will start this game and then I will forget all these questions. So, and feel free to zoom around, look at your other participants, be nosy, that's fine. Um, so let's start. So never have I ever broken a bone. So put a finger down if you've broken a bone. Okay. Never have I ever been to a presentation about mentalizing. I did have to put in sort of a nerdy one there. It can't all be fun. Uh, never have I ever adopted a pet. If you've adopted a pet, put a finger down. My adopted pet is laying at my feet right now. Uh, never have I ever been to China. Has anyone been to China? Okay. Never have I ever published a paper. Has anyone published a paper? Got two fingers left. We've got some twos. Anyone on one? Looks like we got a bunch of twos. Let's see. Oh, we've got a one from Jane. Let's see. Never have I ever had a garden. Has anyone ever had a garden? It looks like we have a winner. <laughs> Everyone clap for Jane for our winner. It's nice to learn about each other. So I'm going to return to a PowerPoint. We're going to, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And this is where I want you to enter into the chat box if you can. You can also unmute yourself if you, if you feel like talking, uh, please do. So as we think about that game, how did it feel to play? Give me a few words in the chat of how it felt to play. Oh, Anna Valerie, Valerie also went down. <laughs> Fast. So fun and interesting, buzzy energy. Oh, I like that. Curious, fun to learn about other people. A reprieve, <laughs> for sure. Nice to learn about others. 
Intriguing, focused attention, reminding of fun times, sure did. A little nervous about what could happen, totally. Uh, Max, yeah, love the honesty, awkward for sure. Welcome to my presentations, Catherine. Awkward is my specialty. Surprise from our win one of our winners, yeah. So, and then y'all sharing a little bit about what you were thinking too, right? Were there any other things you were thinking as we played? You know, you maybe thought this was awkward. Uh, you were thinking that maybe this was a little competitive. Yeah. Can you remember how you felt before and how you felt after you played, right? So before you engaged in the game, were you feeling like sort of bleh? And then after the game, were you feeling a little bit more energy? Felt calmer afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Leah's answer is, is me. Nervous before, happier after. Yeah. Zoom fatigued. Yep. All of that. There you go. So y'all are also noticing all these differences, right? Of how it felt before and after. And what you actually just did um, if you've ever done it before, is you just self-mentalized, right? You thought about yourself and in this moment, you thought about your thoughts and you thought about your feelings and you sort of put those two together. So the next step in self-mentalizing, which we'll, we'll talk about mentalizing here in a little bit, is this idea that then you kind of think, oh, well, why did I feel that way, right? I felt a little nervous before. Well, that makes sense. I'm, I'm giving a presentation and those always make me nervous. And afterwards, I felt a little bit more energy. Well, that makes sense because having fun gives us energy, right? And so what I was doing here was a little bit of twofold. It was purposeful in the sense that I was trying to get you all to sort of think of this before and after and how it feels to engage in play. And to be completely honest, I was doing this because being playful on a front end of a presentation helps me get through the presentation a little bit easier, right? So I'm doing it a little bit for you and, and maybe a little bit for me or maybe a lot for me too. But this game is something you can play with anyone. You could play it in a group. You could play it as, um, what are those warm up activities? They have a different word that's escaping me. Uh, you could play it with your friends and family. You could play it in family therapy. There's all these little things we can do to build play into our practice. So I'm gonna move this little box. So how is play helpful, right? From a therapeutic stance, from a child development stance, how is play helpful? So play helps build trust, right? When we play, we're open to learning. We're open to experiencing new things. And hopefully we're doing that with people who are also open, who can, you know, we can be silly in front of, and then they can make us feel okay for being silly, right? If I um, sort of am, and put on a funny voice, right? And you sort of talk back at me with a funny voice and all of a sudden we're having this funny play banter back and forth. I'm gonna start to trust you a little bit more, right? I'm gonna be like, this person can handle me at my silliest. If I did that with someone and they kind of met me with a, you know, or they met me and they're like, why are, why are you being weird? That might sort of damage the trust a little bit. But hopefully as, as children, we have more of those interactions that build, right? We have enough, good enough interactions. Um, that's something with development of all of this is it doesn't need to be perfect, right? We don't need to be perfect parents. We don't need to be perfect therapists. We just really need to be good enough. And I'll, I'll get to that point later when we talk a little bit about mentalization. Play also helps improve self-regulation. Play helps us overcome our impulses. Um, so, you know, if, if you're thinking about um, as a kid, sort of the imaginary role play of, of house, right? Did any, I'm sure people played house or, you know, you were the mom or the, the little kid or the dad, or I always liked to be the dog for some reason, uh, the, the pet that messed up everything, you know? Um, but when you sort of stick to that role, you're in it. So you're not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm playing the mom, but I need to do this as a kid. You're really sort of self-focused and that really teaches our brains to regulate and stay focused and on track. Play also helps us develop mentally develop conflict resolution, resolution skills. So when we play as kids, we come up with rules and roles. 
we navigate each other's minds on the playground, right? So if I play with Tommy today, what is that going to be like? Or, um, you know, we have these overt and covert rules of playing, right? So a, an overt rule would be something, you know, like on the playground, we're taught not to push, right? And there might be a covert rule of, you know, when you ask someone to play, you ask sort of nicely or, or whatever those rules sort of develop in the community. And then also play fosters curiosity, right? When, when we're kids, we're drawn to things that sort of interest us. We pursue what we find interesting. So um, I think of myself as a kid, I, I really liked um, going to those science discovery stores and buying like shiny rocks right? The, uh, kids love rocks. It's, it's an interesting thing, but, but through that, we learn about the earth, and we learn about sort of the levels of the earth, and what magma, and volcanoes, and all of that stuff is, and so it really fosters this curiosity, and for a lot of kids, that then fosters sort of what they want to think about in school, and what they want to do when they grow up, and even if you don't become a scientist when you grow up, maybe you become a social worker, which is kind of like a science, um, you still sort of have those interests, right? I'm still very much interested in, in volcanoes, to be completely honest. I'm having some trouble going to the next slide. Okay, cool. So enough about play, <laughs> enough playing for now. There will actually be um, another activity here in a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about mentalization. We're going to shift out of this idea of what play is and how play is helpful. And we're going to talk a little bit about mentalizing. So mentalizing is the mental and imaginary act of trying to understand your mind or someone else's mind. Um, so when we mentalize, I think when I'm mentalizing someone else, I think, oh, gosh, what's going on in their head? Why did that interaction go that way? And then I call on, what do I know about this person? What do I know about their life, their goals, their drives? Could any of that sort of lead them to have acted the way they did? Sort of, I'm really sort of going over in my mind all of these scenarios, all of these different perspectives that might be there. When I do that to myself, it sounds very similar as we talked about earlier, where I think, how did I feel? Why did I feel that way? Is it because of this? Is it because of that? And I'm sort of just shifting around all these different internal perspectives. Um, so, so this might look like, um, you know, I'm walking down the hall at work. I've, I've told this story before. So if you've been in one of my presentations, uh, you've heard it, but it's, it's very meaningful to me. Uh, I was walking down the hall when I was a fellow, uh, when I was living in Houston, and uh, this employee walked by and, and I interpreted that he rolled his eyes at me. And I thought, oh my God, he hates me. Tony hates me. He thinks I'm dumb. He doesn't want me here. You know, all of these sort of post-grad fellowship anxieties just like totally took over my body, right? And in this place I worked, which was really lovely, I talked to my supervisor about it. My supervisor was like, I think you should go and talk to Tony about that, right? I think you. And so we practiced sort of how to have those conversations and how to approach a conversation like that with curiosity. And I went to him and I said, yeah, you, you passed me on the, in the hall the other day and I could have sworn you rolled your eyes at me and my brain went berserk. And he was really lovely. He was part of the training team for me. And he was like, oh my gosh, Shelly, it was probably my contact, right? My, con my contacts are always messing up, right? And if you wear contacts, you kind of know that thing that you get sometimes where you kind of do like the weird blink. And I wear contacts. And so I was like, oh my gosh, you know, look at me. I sort of in this situation was not mentalizing. I was sort of leaning on myself and what I was going through and my amygdala took over and I left no room for, for perspective. But in talking to Tony, I was able to say, ah, there are more perspectives to this. It could have just been his contact. He could have been having a bad day. Heck, it could have even been about me. That could quite possibly be it. I doubt it was, but it could have, right? So I was able to sort of gather all of these extra perspectives. And that really helps sort of bring me back down and ground it. And it also sort of takes my vision from this to this, which is always helpful. So um, mentalization was developed out of a couple of different things. Neuroscience is certainly one of them. Systems theories and how we interact with the world and how the world interacts with us and all these different systems. Uh, philosophy of the mind, I always struggle with that word. So 
So uh, Dr. Fonagy and, and, and Dr. Bateman were very big into literature and philosophy, and they used a lot of um, writings to sort of form these ideas. And, and then of course, a lot of it, and why I think mentalization and play go so well together, is because mentalization was also birthed out of an attachment theory, out of attachment studies, about this idea that we learn to mentalize from our caregivers. So, um, you know, this might not be new information to any of you, but when we're babies and we're crying, our parents, if they can, meet us with some coos and some comfort. And then we understand in our little baby brains, you know, if I cry and ask what I need, mom is going to give, give it to me, right? She's going to comfort me. And that's on a good day with moms, right? And this is where that good enough parenting comes in. Because sometimes if a baby's crying, mom might not have the capacity to give the oohs and the ahs and the coos. Mom might give a straight face, right? And that might teach the baby, oh, let's, let's not ask for what we need, right? And I'm making the baby a really heightened level thinker. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's the idea that we sort of want a mix of that stuff in development. We want the sort of the good and the bad and the good enough. Um, there's actually, when I was researching for this, came across the study that said parents that are really good at mentalizing that are almost like 100% mentalizing, their kids actually then struggle to mentalize um, because it doesn't teach rupture and repair. It doesn't teach this idea that in relationships, you're going to not be mentalized, but in relationships, you're not going to be understood. Um, and I really liked that. I really liked that idea because I'm, I'm I'm telling my staff quite often, like, don't be afraid to sort of rupture, you know, don't do it purposely. Don't, you know, go in swinging, but don't be afraid to sort of cause some conflict in your therapeutic relationship. If you have a relationship there, it's a really great way to teach repair. So mentalization, why is it helpful? This little graph might uh, be a little familiar. It builds and repairs trust, rupture and repair. If I'm holding your mind, in my mind, you're gonna trust me a little bit more. You're gonna think that person understands me. They're putting me in the expert seat of my own life. And that's really important for people in therapy because some people have had bad therapy and bad treatment in which they've been taken out of their expert role. And they've been told, no, you don't know what you're talking about. This is actually what you need to do, right? And not that in mentalization, we always agree with people. It's not this idea that it's like, they're always right. But it's this idea of, okay, so that, you think that works for you. Okay, tell me how you think that works for you. Is there any other thing that could work with you? It's really sort of going with the flow. Um, I, you know, I think the rolling with the resistance sort of piece. So mentalizing helps improve self-regulation. So mentalizing in therapy really helps build this trusting attachment relationship, a reparative relationship. And through that relationship, we learn that self-regulation, right? Because as a therapist, if someone comes to me for crying, I am going to give them the oohs and the ahs and the comfort, right? Like that's, that's my job. That's my role, right? And if I notice I'm really struggling to do that, I probably need some time off. I need to go to West Texas. I need to zip line through the desert, through some canyons um, and come back to work. <laughs> So mentalizing also helps us understand conflict because mentalizing a lot is about understanding misunderstandings as my example with Tony, right? If I just really took that as straight up conflict, I would really get small in meetings. I would probably not speak up. It would really impact me, right? But working to understand that misunderstanding with him really helps sort of not only open up a space at the table for me, in my fellowship, but it, it also helped me build a relationship with Tony. It helped me sort of know that he's a safe person to go to. Um, and then mentalizing is really about leaning into curiosity, really about imagining, inquiring, exploring, coming up with, sharing, all of those sort of good questions, you know. Um, in training, I, I used to have a supervisor that told me, uh, when in doubt, be curious. And I always hate it when he said that. Um, because I was like, I'm too anxious to be curious. Uh, but, you know, over time and in 10 years of, of working as a clinical social worker, I've learned, you know, how to, when in doubt, be curious, right? What do you mean by that? Sometimes as therapists, we can kind of just go with the flow. We can kind of sort of fake our, fake our curiosity or fake that we kind of know what's going on. And, and in a mentalizing stance, 
Um, this is more so you kind of stop it when you stop understanding or you stop it when you can't make the connections anymore and you get really curious. Um, there's two different types of mentalization uh, we can do in therapy. Uh, we can take a mentalization based stance, right? And that's just sort of what I'm talking about, this curiosity, this having the client as the expert. Um, and then there's actually mentalization based therapy, which has certain techniques and certain things that you do. Um, and sort of an onboarding process to the therapy. Um, and in that onboarding process, I oftentimes will tell my clients, like, you might find me a little bit annoying on the front end. I'm probably going to ask more questions than a normal therapist, right? I'm probably going to interrupt you a little bit more um, to sort of make sure we're on the same page and I'm really understanding your mind. And I, I haven't, I don't think, had anyone sort of complain about that. Um, I think people typically kind of enjoy this type of therapy. Um, so we're gonna play another game. I'm not gonna close my screen on this one, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show a couple of pictures. And what I want you to do is sort of think in your mind, what is going on in this picture? I want you to mentalize the image and the people in it. So let's all kind of just take a moment to look at this picture and sort of think, you know, where might these people be? What might they be doing? There's some context clues you can certainly pick up. Um, just thinking a little bit. Does everyone have a good, I'm not going to ask you sort of what color coat was the guy wearing, although that would be kind of a fun game. Okay, so as we think about that picture, what do you imagine is going on in that photo? Feel free to use the chat to sort of let me know. A networking event, yeah. Coffee, corporate breakouts, a group activity. Totally, all of that stuff. Tr trying to get it to go to my next question, but it's not going. Oh, that's because I'm in the chat feature. Sorry, y'all are seeing my mind in action. Um, what might these people be thinking or feeling? Any guesses? Engaged, yep. Joy, <laughs> dreading a group activity. I <laughs> love that one, Leah. Performing, totally. Relaxing. Yeah. What led you to these answers, right? And you don't have to enter this into the chat box. But, you know, if you feel comfortable, <laughs> getting their sugar break. <laughs> So if you think about and you continue to sort of, yeah, so facial expressions, body language, right? Overwhelmed, yes. So I think what's interesting about this activity and, and when we do it is oftentimes what leads to our answers is based off of our own personal experiences, right? When I, when I saw that picture, I thought, oh, yeah, networking event. And now, how might these people be thinking and feeling? dread. Right? I don't like networking events. Um, and, and that's the interesting thing. And that's where we can kind of get caught in mentalizing. There's this idea, it's called the 90-10 rule. So 10% of what we're interpreting is actually going on. 90% of what we're interpreting is all of the stuff we're bringing in, right? So our past experiences, our past interactions that are similar to this, how we felt when we woke up that morning, right? Did we wake up on the right side of the bed or the wrong side? And it's this idea that, you know, we all sort of are carrying around different things. And so if I'm 90 10 a situation, the person with me is probably gonna 90 10 a situation. And I like thinking about that because I think it also allows for a good amount of grace in relationships, right? If my husband comes home from work and he seems grumpy and that sort of, at me, right? My God, why is he mad at me? If I sort of 90, 10 the situation, I might be able to think, well, maybe he had a hard day at work. Maybe it's not about me or, or maybe actually I had a hard day at work and I'm feeling a little bit more sensitive. And so we call on all of these other sort of 90% of our lives. We're going to do this activity one more time, but we're going to do it in a play situation. Um, and so we'll just enter into the chat box, sort of what do you think is going on in this, in this photo? Did 
dodgeball. Oh, <laughs> I did not think that. That gives me anxiety. Anxious to throw it to who? Yep. Friendly competition. <laughs> me and gym class in grade school. <laughs> Classes and everything for me. Strategizing, assessing the situation. Yeah. And think too, what, what leads you to think this, right? The kids got a really a concentrated, it seems, face. The way the frame of the photo is set up, there looks like there needs to be a decision to determine who to throw it to, right? And then we might have our own childhood experiences that kind of inform the way we see this, right? If you were an athletic kid, maybe you see it one way. If you were a non-athletic kid, maybe you see it another, right? He has a little curly-ish red hair, so <laughs> hoping his glasses don't get broke, right? And the curly red hair, you know, I kind of, I kind of connect to that, right? So it's just, it's this idea, you know, and that we sort of make up these stories, some of which are, are really great and some of which aren't accurate. And the idea of mentalizing is try to like find the middle ground and then discuss that with the people you're trying to mentalize with. So when does mentalizing get difficult? Well, it gets difficult under heightened stress. It gets difficult when we're having really hard emotions. It gets difficult when we're dysregulated. That's all because of survival, right? That's not because we malfunction as human beings or we're not good enough to mentalize or we're not worthy of it or we're broken somehow. It's literally based off of survival. We wouldn't mentalize a tiger. We would run, right? We wouldn't take the perspective of the situation most likely. The, the one perspective I guess we probably would take is where's the exit? How can I get there, right? Where's the safest place? We wouldn't say, oh, I wonder if that tiger's about to attack me, or I wonder if that tiger's had a bad day, <laughs> right? We would just get up and go. And that's helpful for survival, but it can really impact our relationships, right? If we're letting our survival brain, our amygdala, that sort of back part of our brain sort of take over our prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking part of our brain, um, because we might enter into conflict in relationships, right? We might fight, flight, or freeze in relationships. And I think we see that a lot with our clients who experience interpersonal difficulties, right? And a lot of these clients walk around thinking something's wrong with them when it's really not, right? It's a brain thing and it's a sort of a, a skill-based thing that they can totally learn and turn back on. I've, I've seen it. Um, and really helping people know when to mentalize and when not to mentalize is important. You know, sometimes after I teach about mentalizing, especially to clients, people will be like, so I have to do this 100% of the time? And I'm like, no, absolutely not, right? There's also this idea of following your gut and your intuition. If something feels bad, get out, right? Um, but if something feels like, huh, maybe this conflict with my husband, I, I could maybe think about it a little bit better. Maybe we calm down and we re-enter it and we say, huh, you know, when you said that, I felt this way and I was thinking that and I was curious about what was going on in your mind. Can you share that with me, right? This idea that it's, it's a back and forth. Um, before we get any further into mentalization, are there any, um, any sort of questions or discussion points that you want to talk a little bit more about? I'm going to use the break to take a sip of water. Okay. It does sound like maybe someone is not on mute. So can you make sure you're on mute? I can only see a select number of people on my screen. Okay. Very good. So we'll move on. So as a therapist, you might be thinking, okay, well, this is great. I kind of understand what mentalizing is. I could probably do it with myself, but how do I do it with a client? How do I know when it's happening, when it's not, right? I'm going to talk a little bit about non-mentalizing modes. Um, these are certainly some sort of um, bigger words. I don't want you to get caught up in the vocabulary. I want you to more so keep in mind and think about times in which you've either felt this way or which you kind of noticed the client feel this way um, or seem this way, because that's when some of this play and mentalization stuff can really uh, come in handy. So the first mode of non-mentalizing is called psychic equivalence. 
And this is the idea that sort of how I feel is a fact about what's going on around me, right? So I feel like I'm a piece of crap and no one likes me and all that stuff. And then I really just project that and I people sort of seem to act that way to me. So how I feel is how I interpret the outside world, right? And it can be really rigid, it can be inflexible, it can be really certain, right? No, I'm certain they don't like me because of X, Y, and Z, because I'm not good enough, because I've, you know, I have anger issues or whatever, right? These sort of dysregulatory things that, that people really struggle with. You'll see um, a lot of people who have experiences of, of BPD symptomology, um, they can oftentimes slide into psychic equivalents pretty easily and get pretty certain that they know exactly what's going on around them and exactly what's in other people's minds and how those people feel and think about them, right? And that's a really sort of hard place to sit as a client. I feel a lot of empathy for those people in that certainty. Um, but as a therapist, sometimes I, I feel like I kind of want to fight them on it. Like I want to sort of get into a power struggle about it. Or I feel really angry. Like, how could you be so certain about this? Or maybe even sometimes, especially if I've been working with a client for a while, I start feeling a little hopeless, right? Like, I don't think I can help. I don't think I'm going to be able to help this person. And when we're in that, we're sort of, we're in this non-mentalizing mode with them, right? We're allowing them to stay certain, right? And we're not sort of pushing the certainty or asking questions. Um, we might even, because of our own experiences, sort of slip out of the room a little bit. You know, we as therapists can do that. Uh, and so really, if listening for this certainty is really all I want you to take away. It's, and when you hear sort of very certain facts, like, no, I know this is it. That's because they might be in a non-mentalizing mode. I will say I, I did work with a client that um, was always really certain about how her parents would respond to situations. And I would always try to get her to think about different perspectives. And then she was always right. <laughs> it was wild. Um, but she was a very intuitive person. She sort of was a very like, look at the bigger picture and, and take information. And, you know, we would kind of joke and play around with this because I would be like, yeah, you might be right. That's exactly what they might do. But, you know, what are the other sort of things they might do? How else do you think they might handle the situation? What else do you think they might be thinking about? You know, sort of opening up a little bit more perspective. Uh, but then when she would come back, you know, the next week, I would definitely be like, oh my gosh, you're, you're good. You've got this, uh, but let's not stay in certainty. This other mode is called theological mode, and it's an externalized and concrete mode. It's, it's where we use, instead of using our internal self to figure out what's going on around us, we use our external self to inform our, our internal. So um, a great example of this is um, this idea of like a therapist, a client thinking their therapist is bored in a session, right? The therapist yawned, I must be boring, right? I'm using these, the therapist looks tired, looks angry, looks anxious, it must be about me, right? Um, we see that a lot. And I think that when we really have to enter into these conversations with our clients that, that we're incredibly human, right? And I might be tired in a session, but it, it's most likely not because of you, right? It's because I didn't sleep well, or it's because of X, Y, and Z. And this, this mode, we'll hear a lot of assumptions, right? Like, I'm going to assume what's going on as the client. I'm going to assume it's about me. I'm going to assume you can't handle me, right? I'm going to assume you don't care about me because you're not doing X, Y, or Z, right? And the therapist experience of this is that we feel really oftentimes pulled to fix it, to solve it, to argue it. No, 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 that's not what's going on, right? This is what's going on. Or I do care about you, so I'm going to extend our session by 10 minutes right? Never a great boundary to cross. So in this mode, um, listen for assumptions. Don't argue with the assumptions, but be curious about them. I'm curious how you made, you know, I'm curious how you got to that. I yawned and then you perceived that as, as me being bored with you. Can you tell me about that? Can you tell me about how that shows up in other places of your life that are really leaning in that, to that curiosity? And then the third mode is pretend mode. And this is sort of a, this I think it's kind of a harder one to spot because I think sometimes we think we spot it and it's kind of just avoidance. Um, but pretend mode is this sort of very disconnected and superficial sort of presentation from the client. Um, and this can go sort of one or two ways for the therapist. Sometimes the therapist can feel really detached, like 
you know, if you start thinking about your grocery list while you're with the client, chances are the client's also thinking about something that's not happening in the room. <laughs> so checking that out. Um, this also happens when you have that client that just like really agrees with you. Um, and I don't know if anyone's had this experience. I, I, I'm sure you have, but sometimes you end a session and you're like, that was really good. Like we made progress. And then you come to the next session and it feels like no progress had been made, right? That's a good sign that that's sort of this pretend mode. This idea of like, I'm just gonna nod and say, yes, kind of get you off my back, uh, not let you in, right? It's, it's, a, it's a defense. Um, and so in, in this, the curiosity is, is, and the playfulness is sort of around really playing, sort of lighting the fire under the client, putting their feet to the fire, or um, really just sharing your, your boredom or your detachment and seeing it with the client thing. Are there any questions about these modes? I will say um, these modes could be a presentation all on their own. This was a very sort of, simple explanation. I, I just wanted to give you guys or you all um, some ideas of how to spot this when it's going on in the room. So if you take away anything from how to spot non-mentalizing, it's when we hear certainty, when there's a lot of assumptions being thrown around and then believe, and when there's sort of this disconnect of, well, the work feels good, but nothing is happening and, and what's going on here, this detachment sense. So how do we integrate play and mentalization together? Huh. Quite a bit of different ways. Um, we can use humor, right? It's cheesy to say, but I believe it wholeheartedly. Laughter is the best medicine, right? So when I'm integrating sort of playfulness with a client, um, say they might be really detached or they, you know, it might be some clients really need like a warm up period, right? I might utilize humor. I might, you know, make a joke when they come in or if they're, you know, stuck in this sort of certain place, I might enter in a really humorous perspective. So I had a, a client that I was really close with and we had sort of a good working and joking relationship but to kind of make some, some jokes to her. Um, and I would be like, okay, yeah, that could be actually what happened. They could not like you or or they could have had a bad day. That could be one, or maybe they had to go to the bathroom really bad and that's why they ran out of the room, right? And then, you know, like, has that ever happened to you? And sort of utilizing some humor and some laughter and even some light bathroom humor, to be honest, um, to sort of get the person out of their stuck place and in their prefrontal cortex, right? To think about, oh, maybe it was the bathroom. And my favorite is when I do that with clients and then they come back with like an even weirder one, or maybe it was this, right? And we can kind of just go down the rabbit hole of all the weird things that it might have been or might have meant. And then at the end of that, we can sort of say, okay, 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 okay. So what of all this do we believe might actually sort of be happening? And we can sort of get back on track. Um, I think to use humor in mentalization, uh, it has to be really authentic. Uh, it has to really come from a, a place of like comfortability and, and banter. Um, I, I wouldn't use humor with a client that I didn't. Well, I, I use humor in all aspects of my life. But if I don't know a client very well, I'm probably not going to lean into the humor as much, right? I'm going to get to sort of know the waters and the temperature before I do that. Another way to integrate play and mentalization is to literally get up. Get up out of your seat. Get up out of your office. Um, I had this really, um, used to run groups of young adults that in the groups were based on around sobriety and harm reduction and substance use. Uh, and sometimes they would get really stale and we would kind of all just sit there and it was supposed to be a process group, but no one was bringing anything into the room and I was feeling frustrated. And so one day I had um, everyone, I said, okay, we're going to do something different. I want you to look across the room at the person sitting across from you. And I sort of said, you know, Dave, look at Alan, Jess, look at Mike, you know, I sort of paired them up and I said, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to study how they're sitting, right? Study how they're sitting, think about how they might be thinking, feeling. So we did that for a moment and I said, okay, now I want you to get up and change seats. And I had them change seats. And I said, now I want you to act out all the other person. And so I had them sort of take on the role of the other people in the group. 
And then we talked about, well, what, what do you think that means that, that Mark was sitting like that? Was, do you think he was bored? What makes Mark bored? What's boring about this group? Like, let's just put it out there. Um, and just this idea that we can, we can get up and we can move our bodies and we can use that to mentalize other people. It's, I, I, it's a bit psychodramatic, but it was, it was a really cool experience. Um, you can also sort of get up and just, uh, in, you know, in Arlington and Los Angeles, both of the places I've worked for Ellen Horn, you can get up and you can go for a walk. You can go to the park. You can put your feet in some water. You can get a bubble tea. Uh, all of these things that sort of uh, turn our senses back on can be really helpful, as you all know, in turning our brains back on and helping with that mentalization. Another thing you can do is you can turn up the dramatic. You can act it out, right? I had a client once who had a ton of anger um, and it was really sort of hard for me to understand his anger because he wasn't a very emotive person, right? He couldn't, he didn't have a lot of words to describe it other than feeling angry. And, and so I really struggled in my curiosity to really understand how his anger impacted him. Uh, and so we turned on the dramatics. We, we acted out the anger, right? I said, if you're anger, was a boulder, where would you be carrying it? How heavy would it be, right? And I had him really sort of show me his anger. So we acted it out. <laughs> Another thing I've done um, with a client, particularly in pretend mode, is um, I've rolled my eyes so hard I fell out of my chair, right? Um, so I had this client who would sort of vent a lot. And then whenever I tried to be curious about it, I hit a wall, right? And it, it was never, um, never brought back to her. It was always super externalized. And that was something we talked about a lot. And we joked about a lot. And I, I think I'd been working with her for about six months at this point. So one time we were sort of in this interaction and I was like, oh my gosh, we are here again. And I sort of threw my head back and rolled my eyes and like slipped out of my chair. Um, and we just like cracked up and, and, you know, I got back in my chair and I was like, why did you think I did that? And she knew exactly why I did that. <laughs> so we were able to talk about that. And then we were able to sort of do it to one another. So there'd be times in which I'd remind her of a DDT skill and she'd roll her eyes and slip out of her chair. Um, and even upon sort of ending the relationship with this client, it was something she called on as being sort of really funny and really sort of surprising that I would do because she had gone, you know, to very sort of professional, I am a professional therapist, but very professional stiff therapist in New York. And, and no one had ever sort of interacted with her in that playful way. I noticed that the chat feature is going off. Leah, can you help me with that before I, I go to the rest of these? Yes, we do have two questions. The first one being, how about when BPD person reacts very negatively to humor or jokes? sees them as minimizing situations they see as grave, infuriating, hopeless, et cetera. Yeah, okay. So with that one, that's it's such a great question because it happens, right? And there's this idea of falling on your sword and mentalizing, right? Oh, gosh, I really overstepped here. And this sort of goes to the playing of the dramatics, like, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm showing you with my body, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm you know, you're hearing that I'm sorry. I, I think I really messed up. You seem angry now. Can you tell me about that? Can you tell me if there was something I did to make you angry? Can you remember sort of what we were talking about before I made you angry? Can we go back to that topic, right? And it's this sort of working through this rupture. If the client is dysregulated, that might not work too well, right? If their brain is sort of fully going amygdala style, um, that might be actually a time for some DBT skills or some grounding skills or self-soothing, right? Um, I'm gonna skip down to the sixth one, the stop, uh, the non-mentalizing equals non-mentalizing. So when our clients get really dysregulated and they can't mentalize anymore, it makes it really hard for us to continue mentalizing them, right? Because oftentimes in situations like that, my anxiety starts to rise. Um, and so that's, I, I love that about helping a client ground because it also helps me ground, right? I love teaching deep belly breathing because it gives me a chance to take a deep breath. And, and I think all of that is, is not only a great skill for them to practice in therapy and take out of therapy, but I also think it's really great for them to see someone mirror that. Um, so never be afraid to sort of fall on the sword and say, oh gosh, I think I really messed up. Um, you know, I, um, I put my foot in my mouth often, right? 
it's a very human part of me. I do it in therapy. I do it at work. I do it in my personal life and, and really sort of knowing authentically my slip ups and apologizing for them goes a long way. And I will say it has to be authentic. Um, people who struggle with the symptomology of BPD can smell out inauthenticity, inauthenticity. I, you know what I'm saying? They can smell that out pretty easily. Um, and so if you don't mean it, don't say it, right? I was working with a client once. I'm laughing now. It was such a hard situation. She walks into my office. She sits down. She tells me something. And I sort of, I, I start saying something and she, she goes, Shelly, I don't need your today. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? And then she sort of goes off to sort of list sort of what is going on about me, right? I'm, I don't need to hear your opinions. I don't need this, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was feeling really overwhelmed in that situation. Of course, it, it felt like an attack. It, it kind of was an attack. Um, and I couldn't authentically wrap my head around anything I had done, right? Uh, this could have very well been a very good 90-10 situation where it was 10% about us and 90% about what was going on with her day. So what I did in that moment is I was like, I'm going to have to stop you because what you're talking about sounds really important. And it sounds like something I've done has really impacted you. And I really want to understand that, right? I'm not sure I can understand that right now. If we keep going like this, can we take a break? Right? So we took a break. We actually ended early. I was working in a milieu so I could see her quite frequently. Uh, and so then she, I sort of, I thought about what she said. I actually took it to a mentalization based supervision. Um, and it sort of came to light, well, you probably have stopped mentalizing her and she's probably really felt sort of some judgment and blah, blah, blah. And so I thought about what she said. I thought about what my supervisor said and I came to the conclusion of what felt accurate to me. Right? And I went back and I said, I've been thinking and this is what I think. And, and I shared and I apologized. And in you know true form of working with a young adult, she was like, it doesn't matter anymore. And I was like, and it does, <laughs> right? It does matter. Um, because we are in this relationship and we're not going to ignore things. And that's, that's not my job. And we were able to really repair and, and that felt really powerful. Um, and that takes me to the switching topic idea, this finding neutral ground. So when you're playful and you're mentalizing, if things go awry, if you put your foot in your mouth, get back to neutral ground, right? And I put a picture of a dog there because most of my clients have pets and pets are neutral ground, right? And it might sometimes seem really silly to my clients that they're sort of in the middle of crying. And I'm like, I see you're crying, but I remember this story about your dog. Can you tell me about your dog, right? And it might seem really weird, but usually they follow me. And then what I'll say is, is when we're more grounded, I'll say, I switched topics. That was weird. I know that was weird, but I did it purposefully. I switched topics purposefully because this is what I imagine was going on in your head. And this is how I know to help ground you. You know, so I'm, I'm broadcasting my intentions. I'm broadcasting my thoughts. I'm not playing tricks. Um, I'm not switching topics just to switch topics because I don't care about their feelings. I'm, I'm doing it in a sense to help them ground. And that can be playful. But it can also be a really calm thing to do. So we have another question. Uh, Anne asks, is mentalizing an evidence-based practice? When was it invented? And then also added, it has elements of other good therapy, of course. Yes. So mentalization is an evidence-based practice. Um, it came about in the late 80s, formalized in the early 90s um, by Peter Fonagy and Dr. Bateman uh, in the UK. They both run the Anna Freud Center uh, for Children and Family in the UK. And that's where a lot of the research of mentalization comes from. Uh, mentalization started as a way to understand children. So as I said earlier, it was it's spread out of an attachment theory and attachment research. And so they really started utilizing mentalization in schools um, and with teachers and with students. And then they were like, oh, this is really good. And uh, they also then started researching how it works with BPD and it's very effective with people who have BPD symptomology. Um, the research has also come out of the Minniger Clinic and Gunderson uh, out of McLean. Uh, they are all sort of actively involved in uh, mentalizing with Dr. Fonagy, uh, Silver Hill as well. Um, I, full disclosure, I was at Minninger before I was at Ellenhorn, so that's where I kind of cut my teeth on mentalization with Dr. Fonagy. Um, 
but yes, it's, it's very well researched. Uh, there's a ton of really great books. I, if, um, if you work with people with borderline personality and you want to know more about mentalization, this is like my favorite book. Um, I, I keep it by my work station because oftentimes if I get questions, um, you know, I, I, uh, and I, I can't answer, I go to this book. It's called Mentalization Based Treatment for Personality Disorders, a Practical Guide. Um, buy them used, better for the environment, cheaper, all that good stuff. Um, mentalization is um, sort of a combination of a psychoanalytic therapy, psychodynamic, and a CBT-based therapy. They kind of say that uh, mentalization falls in the middle because it takes these psychoanalytic and dynamic systems and thoughts and attachment, but it also takes the CBT sort of very thoughtful, change your thoughts, think differently idea. Uh, it goes well with DBT because DBT goes well with people who have symptomology of DPT. Um, what I will say about mentalization and, and why it's helpful um, for a lot of my clients at Ellenhorn is because Ellenhorn, we get clients who have been through a ton of treatment and really haven't felt any better. And oftentimes we get clients who can sort of read me a DBT manual. They could teach a group, but they couldn't use it. And that's because they really don't understand themselves and their internal selves and all these stories they make up and the certainty assumptions they live in. So doing even just a, a couple of psycho eds around mentalization can really help people sort of think about it and learn about themselves a little bit more and then they can put those DBT skills into action. What else do we have, Leah? There are no other questions in the chat, just a few people saying thank you because they have to hop off. Great. Uh, if Thanks. anyone else does have questions, um, Shelly can stay on for a little longer. Feel free to, free to throw them in the chat or unmute yourself and just ask them. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everyone. And the last little thing was just play something, right? Play a game. Uh, you can play the, the, the one we played earlier. You can bring printed out pictures um, like we did. Uh, another game I like to play in groups is print out a bunch of um, like famous artwork and put them on the floor and then have each group member pick up a piece that calls to them and then have the group sort of share why they think that person picked that based off of what they know about that person. Um, and that's a really, it works well with groups, uh, like process groups that are really sort of connected, know each other well. Um, you can also do it in a psycho ed group if, if there's, you know, if a milieu is involved. But also just asking a client to play you a song, show you a video. Uh, I, TikToks. I'm, I watch a lot of TikToks these days from clients. Uh, I also get sent a lot of them that we talk about. Well, I really appreciate all of you coming today. If, if you have any questions or any other things you want to discuss or feedback for me, I'd love to hear it. I have a question. Um, what, I mean, I'm familiar with um, mentalization-based therapy. Um, for borderline primarily and some of Fonagy's work, but I haven't been following it closely. Um, who's the ideal client? I mean, it, it seems like it applies to any patient, but when you're thinking about it, like, I mean, I would think it would be hard to apply, let's say for someone with OCD or yeah. like, so when you're, your, your ideal client would be who? I'm just, so the, I'm just curious because yeah thinking of it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think if we're thinking diagnostically, ideal clients would be the, the cluster B personality stuff, okay. whether it's diagnosed or that's just how they show up in life. Um, also complex trauma, um, typically clients who have complex trauma. Can y'all still hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear okay, you. Cool. Sorry, I had something ringing here. I'm okay. sorry. No worries. Uh, so people who've experienced complex trauma oftentimes have really lost Sort of sense of themselves and and uh, mentalization can help with that there's new research about antisocial personality disorder about using it with those folks um which i now, don't you know what about, what about because like i would be concerned let's say with patients with trauma i mean about body image issues or like that mm -hmm. they would feel that they're being judged in some yeah. way i mean obviously you would talk about it but i'm just I'm just wondering because I find it very compelling the uh, mentalization piece mm -hmm. in general, but I'm I find sometimes that I'm not sure how to use it or that I use it intuitively and I'm not so aware of it. 
Mm -hmm. That's probably it. You, it. We, I think as therapists, we uh, all use it intuitively. I think there, there is an implicit uh, mentalization process that we all do every, every day. You know, it's like you see a car coming down the street and you step out of the way. Um, or you see that your partner has a frown on their face and you think they might be sad. Like that's really just quick mentalizing we're doing. Um, so but you do probably you always label it for them? I usually do because mentalizing is a lot about transparency. Um, and so I don't want people to think I'm sort of encroaching on their mind, right? Like I might even ask permission. Can I share what I, I think maybe is going on in your mind? And you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, can I give you, or can we take a second to think about some other perspectives? Um, so sort of asking permission. I think that's why the, it works with trauma folks, because you're asking permission. You're being very thoughtful. You're sharing your mind. Uh, you're not sort of being, you're trying hard not to feel intrusive. Um, and mentalization can be really slow too, you know, you can mentalize maybe five minutes of your appointment and then the rest of the appointment is spent doing something else. Um, I, I will say it has shown in research, it works with people with eating disorders um, to help them sort of understand their eating disorder, how it shows up, when it shows up, what systems sort of helped create it uh, and just, how it's not all in them. Spend, thank you. When you say to spend five minutes of mentalizing, it sounds like it's an active engagement and now we're going to do this versus something that happens because many of the descript many of the examples you gave mm -hmm. seem to be natural things that occur in a dynamic where mm -hmm. I would bring it up or the client or yeah. the patient would bring yeah. it up. So, yeah, so how how that might look in, in sessions with me is is um, you know clients like really sharing about their day and they're venting and they're sharing about this argument maybe they had with their partner and I'm going to say I'm going to put on the gas a little bit I'm going to ask you this let's explore you a little bit more and I'll do that for um and they'll be like I'm tired of doing it. I don't want to talk. give me two more minutes put on the gas you know and then sort of we back off right and that's that sort of active explicit mentalization based work whereas as therapists we're doing a lot of the implicit all the time but I oftentimes do use the term, I'm gonna put my foot on the gas for a couple of minutes. Like we're gonna, we're gonna move forward through this conflict just for a little bit. And then do you analyze it or do you stay away from the analytic stance? I stay away from analytic stance. Um, okay. I, might, I might give some interpretations, but the interpretations are very, if they think that I'm completely off, okay, why am I off? Let's, let's go down there so that they stay sort of in that expert role. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Can I, I just want to add that um, the population with substance use disorder has a great deal of trouble mentalizing and like there's, you know, research around that and why mm -hmm. a lot comes back to the interplay between attachment and also the effects right. of the substances. Um, and so if you're working, I mean, just from my own experience, like caveat is it's so hard for them that when you're working with them on it, it can be really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so you have to like, you really have to remind yourself that this is not coming naturally. This is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in groups, it's, it's been really frustrating because you're trying mm -hmm. to bring them to that place and they're just not getting there. And it may not even be that they're not trying, mm -hmm. but they're just missing the ability like they're not quite, quite mentalizing. Yeah. Um, so, but, but it is really when you can get mentalizing the ability to mentalize to, to develop with the individuals who are struggling mm -hmm. with addiction. I mean, it's such a game changer. Thank you. R relating to that developmentally, I mean, from what age would you expect a child to be able, I mean, of course they, you do it as you develop. I mean, kids, but when would you consider like in, if one can say normal development mm -hmm. or whatever that means, when would you expect it as someone who's working in this field for a while? I, you know, I'm not sure because I don't and have never worked with children. <laughs> um, I, I know that they put mentalization based curriculums in schools as early as elementary. Um, so in, I think in the, in the UK, I've seen stuff as early as like seven and eight, they're doing this work. Um, so, so you know, I, curriculum. So some schools um, are are paired with the Anna Freud Center, 
and their teachers go through these trainings. It's, it's really, check out Anna Freud Center for Families and Children's website. Uh, they do so many cool things in the UK. And uh, one thing I, this is a total tangent, but one thing I love about mentalization uh, and that it comes out of Anna Freud is they also do low cost services, right? Like people aren't paying for these services. Um, you know, and they give back a lot to the community. And I, I really love being involved in with the Anna Freud Center because of that. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. But yeah, the substance use piece is huge. I, you know, uh, a lot of practitioners see substance use disorders as attachment disorders and as complex trauma. And so mentalization is, is really great, but it can be really hard. And I think a lot of times people who have used substances oftentimes hyper mentalize. So they really are sort of in people's heads and sort of saying, knowing sort of the next steps of other people, uh, because that's how they've kept their addiction fueled and alive and going. And so it's really helping people understand that, like, that's actually not a healthy way to live life. And um, I worked with a client once who would do that to me. And I would tell her, it feels really intrusive to me when you get into my mind like that. Like, it feels kind of creepy, you know, like we had a good relationship, so I could say that, but it's true, this hypermentalization can really push people away. Yeah. Yeah. I think that happens often um, with ADHD. Hmm. Mm -hmm. To yeah. the developmental piece, Perry's work is really helpful, I think, you know, kind of where, where are the wounds and, and some people, you know, they need uh, you know, a lot of structure and stability and, and, and it, the intellectual is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. People that think that everyone can do DBT don't work with the people that have a lot of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. 